um, on behalf of the uh, Used Car Dealers Association of Utah and also IDS, Independent Dealer Solutions, uh, wanted to uh, welcome you to the class today. Uh, we know you have a choice on where you get your education from and, and uh, we believe that we're the uh, best resource for education since we're on the hill every year for you and on behalf of you representing the used car industry. And uh, as you s will see today as we go through the uh, uh, the booklet that there's a lot of things that affected the used car industry and the very reason why we have an association. Um, <clears throat> if you will look at your three hour renewal class booklet on the inside front cover, it um, talks about why you need to be a member of the association. Um, legislators always want to know who we represent and I always tell them we represent every used car dealer. It's just some of them pay for membership and some of them don't. We hope you're one of the ones that does pay for membership because the things we do certainly benefit you and your business and we're, a, uh, we believe, a great resource for you for uh, the things that we're uh, able to accomplish on Capitol Hill for you. Uh, on page Roman numeral three, there's, uh, this is a table of contents of all the bills that we're going to go through this year. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on each one of them. I've put the appropriate language for each one of those bills to help you understand that. <clears throat> if you have questions, if you want to call later on the phone, please reference your book and say, hey, I have a question on this subject, and then I can reference you to the page number, and so keep this book as a handy reference for you. On page five, um, I'm sure all of you are interested in decreasing your costs of doing your business by 10%. Uh, this is a new IDS program that's available for dealers to, uh, for customer retention. Uh, we put this in here, their uh, customer uh, retention marketing. The Grow Biz Partners is a national program. We are uh, partnering with them. This is a way for you to uh, help maintain the, uh, the people that you have coming into your dealership and making them repeat customers. It's a lot less costly for you to keep the customers you have than to try and generate new ones. So there's the information on, on them and we hope that you'll get a hold of them because uh, we see this as a very beneficial program to affect your bottom line. Um, on page six is our uh, information for IDS. Um, thanks to those of you who use our titling and registration service, we have a lot of dealers who use our service. Uh, we are able to provide solutions for you that you can't find other places. We uh, have a um, real um, passion for making sure that your dealership packets are not rejected because you happen to forget something and we try to work with you to make sure that that never happens. And so uh, we want you to know that that service is available for you and there's a cost for that service but that's something that you can legally include in your documentary service fee uh, that you charge. Um, on page seven is our uh, a little bit of information about our education class. As I said, we're the only entity that represents a used car and the power sport and RV industry on Capitol Hill. The one thing I will say is that we're not attorneys. We don't profess to be, nor do we want to be. But because we're involved in the uh, legal process on Capitol Hill quite a bit, we are asked a lot of questions about what we should and should not be doing. Uh, we always give our uh, best uh, opinion about what you should do in your dealership, but remind you that anything that you do uh, with your dealership. If you have questions, you may want to consult your own legal counsel to make sure you're um, on, firm idea, on your firm foundation there. Uh, we also make sure, want to make sure that, we're, that you talk to us and listen, uh, uh, that we can listen to you and what some of the issues you have. That's how we implement changes on Capitol Hill. That if a dealer has a problem, let's go fix it because if you're having a problem, probably everybody else is as well. So we encourage you to communicate with the association. Uh, on page eight is our antitrust statement. Uh, antitrust is something that's not new, that's been around, it's been, <clears throat> excuse me, around since 1890. But antitrust says that we can't talk about things when we get competitors together. We can't talk about things uh, such as price fixing or boycotting or anything that relates to antitrust in, in fixing the marketplace or putting controls in there that, uh, that should not be in place. Um, page 10 is our locations. If any of you have questions or need help with your title work, uh, we have three locations. Some people forget that we're more than just here in our Midvale office. We have an office in Ogden as well as Orem. And we, uh, I will put up my title clerks against any title clerk uh, to uh, help you get through some of the real fun problems that you see from time to time. We have great staff, great people that do a great job for our dealers. They are, thank you. Appreciate that comment back. Um, before we get into the exact legislation, this was again another record year for the number of bills that were passed. 
Uh, in the 500 range, you figure that the legislature only meets for 45 days and they never meet on Saturday and Sunday, so in about 30 to 31 days, they pass over 500 bills that affect us. So I always say that none of us are safe when the legislature meets. That's probably true to some degree, but that's why we need representation on Capitol Hill. Um, the um, the uh, session was very interesting this year. There wasn't a lot of contentious things like medical marijuana and uh, Medicaid expansion and some of those kinds of things. And the legislators themselves tended to get along pretty well with each other this year, generally speaking. Uh, there's always issues they get uh, sideways with, but uh, the legislature worked very well together and that helps create a good environment uh, when we do have to uh, talk about different uh, bills that we want them to learn about. So having said that on page one, section one, motor vehicle legislation, this is House Bill 18. Uh, it wouldn't be a year with, for the last two or three, we've always talked about Tesla. This is kind of the final piece of Tesla on legislation until a court case is decided. What this bill did, is kind of clarified, uh, the state wanted to clarify when a new dealer comes into the state, what their requirements are so they didn't run into the same problem Tesla had. Tesla called Motor Vehicle Enforcement and said, what do we need to do to have a license? They told them they had to have a location and a few things about what it was, but it didn't give them the whole picture. This bill now will allow any person that comes into the state to do business, if they want to jump through all the hoops to become a dealer, and let's say they're waiting to build a facility like Tesla was, that they could actually get what's called a provisional license. That means they could go through the process of getting their dealership set up. The provisional license did not, however, allow them to sell cars until an actual license was um, uh, granted to them. So this allowed them to put the start of that. Our suggestion when we start talking about this is the whole key to coming into doing business in the state is education. If, a, if someone coming in takes the eight hour education class that we offer, every one of them would know what would be required to be a dealer in the state of Utah and all the hoops they have to jump through through that. And so that was our suggestion and as such, they not only did that but said, if you're gonna do this provisional license, you have to jump through all the hoops, but you may not know uh, where you know the progress of uh, building a new dealership or whatever. Uh, so they allowed a provision in here that says that you could get a provisional license for up to three months and then after three months, um, you had to either declare whether you were going to be ready to open or the tax commission could give you an expansion of that time available for you to open up. So um, this, is, um, this is what they put together as a result of some of the fallout from Tesla from early on. The, per, the uh, issue that we're dealing with with the Tesla situation and the franchise law currently is uh, Tesla challenged and sued the state of Utah in the Utah State Supreme Court. Uh, that, uh, that court case was heard uh, several months ago and we're waiting for a determination. It was actually last fall, we're waiting for a determination from the Utah State Supreme Court to see if adjustments need to be made to the franchise law or if we need to, uh, uh, or if it was even constitutional. So we're waiting to hear from that. Based on what happens there, will depend on what happens with the franchise laws here in the state of Utah. Any questions about that? Perfect, uh, the bottom of page two is, this is more of an information piece because a lot of times you're looked at as an expert in knowing everything there is to know about motor vehicles. This has to do with the handicap placard that's out there. So we put this in as an informational piece. Uh, this bill did pass. And by the way, I didn't mention at the first of every bill, we put who the sponsors were and whether the bill passed and the, and the effective date. This one happens to be January of, two of 2018. Um, but effective 2018, there will be a new placard uh, that will be issued during the, the year that someone can get that's for wheelchair accessibility. You know, where you see some of the current uh, signs that say van accessible and that sort of thing. This bill is kind of written in a way of, you know, you're supposed to be not parking in a van accessible if you don't have a van. In this case, wheelchair accessibility. This says that a person, if you look at on page three, you look at uh, the very, last paragraph C, it says, a person described in section three is encouraged, doesn't say you're required, but is encouraged to avoid parking in a van accessible parking space if the person has a walking disability or a temporary wheelchair placard. And then it says, all other, if all other accessible parking spaces, excuse me, all other accessible parking spaces that are not van accessible parking spaces are occupied. So what that means is they encourage you not to park in those places, but all, if all the handicapped places are, are picked out, you can still park in a van. So it's kind of like 
it's kind of like pirates, right? It's a, it's a you know, process of, it's a recommendation, not necessarily the law. Okay, so that changes with some of the uh, uh, handicap uh, parking uh, situation. Top of page four is mission testing amendments. This bill had to do with the mission testing. Uh, the legislature was concerned that each of the counties are, are uh, taking the authority to exempt certain motor vehicles from emissions. State's trying to keep that a little more uniform and so they put a, uh, a law into place that said the counties can't basically exempt anything unless they would really like to. This language in here talks about uh, the emissions, and this is just emission inspection, not safety. But emissions inspections of uh, things that are not needed, such as farm equipment. Uh, if you look halfway down the page, on page four, uh, vehicles that have a 12,000 pounds or more, vintage vehicles, custom vehicles, those are all still in place that they've been in the past. None, none of that changes. <clears throat> It talks about a pickup truck. If a pickup truck's under 12,000 pounds, it can be exempt if it meets other agricultural uh, definitions, which are on the top of page five. Uh, it all still still maintains about a third of the way down the exemption for a motorcycle or an electric powered vehicle or a vehicle that's a 1967 or older. All those exemptions still uh, fall within uh, the parameters of this emission bill. Any questions about that? Okay. Page six, vehicle safety inspection. Boy, how many years have we talked about this? Like forever? Well, this was a big year. As I mentioned last year in our classes, safety inspection was gonna be a big year. If you remember last year, we uh, did a survey on all of the uh, safety inspection uh, process and whether dealers liked it. 89% of the dealers in the state that we surveyed uh, said that they wanted to keep safety inspection. So what we did is we worked with some other uh, organizations such as the uh, um, uh, stop in emissions and safety inspection places, the uh, glass companies and others, and w they decided to come up with a bill that would increase the frequency of safety inspections. So this first substitute, how, uh, Senate Bill 77, it did exactly that. It was only a three word change that currently in the law it says we have to do safety inspection on year eight excuse me, on year four, year eight, year 10, and every year after. And we just added year six. So we'd do four, six, eight, and 10. And we also had, and the reason why we did those is because that would parallel emissions. So, you know, if you get a notice in the mail, you're always wondering, do I have to do emissions and safety? Some years you have to do both, some years you do neither, some years you do one, some years you do the other. This would avoid all that confusion. This bill actually went through, um, the Senate committee and was on the board in the Senate. When the next bill, third substitute House Bill 265, safety inspection amendments came about from the House. This uh, three, on page seven is third substitute House Bill 365. This is a bill that would repeal safety inspection. This bill passed, okay? So you've probably heard all the news on there about that, whether the governor was gonna sign it, <clears throat> other things. Important part of this change is it's not gonna change until January of 2018. So everything still stays the same until the first of the year. And we'll send out a reminder to all our members saying, remember safety inspection is no longer needed after January 1, with some exceptions, because there are some exceptions in here. Um, what we, um, so we, this bill and just a little bit of our strategy with this bill is we got it through the Senate and we also had the votes to get the, uh, the prior bill, uh, Senate Bill 77 passed, but there was a lot of opposition to not doing away with safety inspection. The Senate members wanted to kind of do away with safety inspection. So we made some proposed changes to them, changed the number of uh, the years that need to be done, uh, certain other factors, and we had the votes to get that done. Well, um, there was some problems with the bill when it came over. Uh, it kind of was the perfect storm where the Senate sponsor of the bill went through the House when it came over to the Senate, the Senate sponsor, Typically, we can kind of direct what committees we want those to go in, where we ha know we have some good voting capability. This happened to be the one that picked it up was the chairman of the rules. Uh, sh she was the chairwoman of the rules committee, and she was able to put that in the committee she wanted to, and thus that uh, the bill uh, passed the committee, meaning that we would repeal safety inspection. Now, how does the law change, okay? If you look at the uh, top of page seven, it talks about the highlighted provisions of the bill. So this bill repeals safety inspection. 
But one of the things that we had the votes to be able to kill this bill, but they, uh, the sen some of the senators added some things that aren't really related to safety inspection in this bill to get it to pass. And what they did is they repealed the uh, primary seatbelt law to make it a, and to confirm that it was a secondary offense that was only that had what they call a sunset date on it that it was only in law for a certain period of time they may now made that permanent that not wearing a seatbelt is a secondary offense and then they also increased the registration fee for uh, all registrations by a dollar for passenger cars and light duty trucks what that did is that allowed the highway patrol to use the existing officers they had in safety inspection that were already appropriated money to, to continue on, but also to take that dollar and appropriate it to highway patrol officers. So the net effect was about 20 to 22 new officers, uh, highway patrol troopers that were going to be on the roads uh, protecting our safety. That's a hard bill to vote against because uh, everybody wants highway patrolmen out there to deal with you know, drunk driving and impaired driving, some of those kinds of things. So it was a very difficult bill to, uh, to uh, uh, kill. And as it's, in, in a sense, we uh, have some plans to uh, revisit that. There is one good piece that came out of that. If you look at the middle of page seven, it talks about a salvage vehicle. One of the things we put on here is a salvage vehicle. And a salvage vehicle typically would be one that would be, typically they come from a salvage certificate to be licensed back on the road. If they're going back on the road, they have to have a safety inspection. Not every year, but it just says that they're subject to a safety inspection when the owner makes the initial application to register. So salvage certificate, get a regular title, has to have a safety inspection. So some safety inspections for salvage vehicles will continue, okay? If you look at the bottom of the page, it talks about where the uh, registration fees are so you look down there for uh, 4550 it goes from 4450 that dollar for motorcycle and from 43 to 44 dollars on passenger cars and light duty trucks so that will be the increase now remember you'll need to make a computer change if you're doing stuff on computer and that doesn't take place until January 1 so don't change it before January 1 okay if you're doing six month registrations over on page eight, you can register a vehicle for six months at a time. That was also changed by a dollar as well. And it's, if you look at uh, paragraph number three there, it says a dealer may sell a motor vehicle as is without an emission inspection if the dealer does not issue a temporary permit. So that was still maintained there that an emission inspection, uh, if you're not putting a temporary permit on it, they're not required. Okay, that means where you're not, if you put a temporary permit on, your re permit on it, you're required to get that, ca this case right now, safety and emissions. Even though we're eliminating the safety inspections, the same rule still applies for an emissions. So that was uh, confirmed in there. Uh, the other thing that it uh, still covers is, which I find is interesting on page nine, is that off highway vehicles, uh, they're going away, but also uh, the trucks are still going to be safety inspected, and most of the big trucking companies do their own safety inspections. Um, and then also, they added, I'll say, vehicles for hire. In other words, buses or vans for hire or a taxi cab. Uh, so it says in paragraph three, about halfway down, a person operating a motor vehicle required to have an annual safety inspection, which I just mentioned. Uh, shall have in the person's immediate possession a safety inspection certificate or other evidence. So uh, one of the questions I have, if I'm a car for hire, if I do like an Uber or, or one of those types of things, if I'm a, if I'm a, a company for hire, I'm going to have to have a safety inspection done on my vehicle every year and have proof of that safety inspection in my car. I found it interesting that, that their safety of out-of-town guests and us who use those types of service, that was more important for safety than all of the rest of us driving around town. Most of the discussion had to do with safety inspection is an inconvenience. Citizens of Utah are spending a ton of money on it and they shouldn't have to. It didn't have, and they said, we're not decreasing the number of fatalities that we're seeing on the road. And our cars are built such that we have airbags and other things that were being protected anyway. Our contention was how many serious accidents or accidents were avoided because somebody was, had to get brakes or tires or something that kept them or causing accidents because their tires don't go in the snow. Uh, so that was more of our argument of the side, um, however they won. Um, the $1 added um, to the registration of those vehicles we talked about as well as the money from the 
uh, safety and current safety inspection program that was already uh, appropriated. Uh, that generated a little over $1.5 million to put those officers on the road. And officers on the road isn't a bad thing, but at the expense of safety is, is somewhat concerning. So the question is, where do we go to the future? And I'd be happy to hear from any of you at all if you have opinions about uh, safety inspection. We've looked at two different things. One of them is going back and implementing a safety inspection program for all vehicles 10 years older, older uh, and keep that portion and bring that back into the system. The other uh, issue we talked about is even though we're repealing safety inspection, part of the law, there's a law out there that says any person, and it's not just dealers, but any person out there cannot be driving an unsafe vehicle. Okay, you have to have a vehicle that is safe. Okay, if that's the case, then why don't we put some penalties on those who are not taking care of their cars, so if they get pulled over, they have bad tires, brakes, whatever, or they're in an accident as a result of that, there ought to be some significant penalties to go with this. Because everybody who hates safety inspection, I found, takes care of their cars. The ones that don't, they want to do away with it because I don't want to have to change my tires. I think we're all guilty of driving on bald tires when we were going to college, right? Okay, I rest my case. So there's going to be more coming on safety inspection even though the repeal happened. Any questions about that? Remember, it does not go into effect until January 1. Okay? Um, on page 10, uh, vehicle inspection amendments. This also has to do with safety inspection that says if somebody is required to do a safety inspection and they get pulled over and cited for a safety violation within two weeks of when their vehicle uh, was supposed to, you know, like for example, if they didn't get it registered because they had an emissions problem or something else, this was a fix-it bill for them that said I can go get that fixed and if I do it within two weeks of getting my ticket, if I got the ticket within two weeks of when my registration expired, I could go back and fix it within two weeks and then I wouldn't have to pay any of the penalties. So that was kind of the fix it ticket uh, bill uh, that tied into uh, safety and emissions. Any questions about that? Great. Salvage. Uh, this was an interesting subject. This has to do with, for the most part, salvage auctions. What this did is codified and put into code what a salvage auction has to do. Well, the problem is that we had some of the buyers that were going to auctions buying salvage and then they would take the car and take it out into the parking lot and somebody would come and pick it up and take it and we had kind of this open hole for curbing cars out there that we never knew who that person was. Uh, they could turn around and sell it and their name never appeared through that even though the law says we can't do that, right? So what this bill did is codified some of the things that the auctions are already doing. If you look at on page 10, it talks about that the auction has to hold that vehicle until the vehicle is claimed by the person who purchased the vehicle, uh, that they can't release it until that per uh, to anybody who is not licensed. But if they're releasing it to about halfway down, it talks about tow truck operators, that the person uh, has that person, if a person who purchased it has a tow truck operator, the operator has to disclose where that vehicle is being um, taken to where it's going to be delivered to. So we're hoping that that will help plug that hole a little bit. Uh, and then it has to have a um, um, authorization by the purchaser that, you know, ABC towing is allowed to send this vehicle to this person. So there's some documentation uh, process. And again, the location has to be uh, strictly adhered to and there has to be records maintained by the auction. Uh, so in a sense, about 90% of this was already in place. It just puts it in code. But the other part that will help is hopefully that Kerber guy who's buying cars and taking two or three of them and building one uh, should be uh, uh, tracked a little bit better. Okay? Anybody in here tow vehicles? You have towing companies, any of you? I'm going to talk about towing for a little bit. On page 13, it talks about uh, vehicle towing amendments. This has to do with towers. They now have to have, and I don't know if they currently do. I haven't uh, had a chance to look at this, but... A uh, tower will have to have a criminal background ground check and a medical examiner certificate. And then they have to have available consumer protection information electronically available to people so they know what their rights are. This bill actually creates a, um, a, a towing advisory board made up of a, a number of different people. For example, a senator, a House member. Um, it uh, talks about... Um, 
again, having to maintain records for towing companies, but uh, if the towing industry is on top of this, they'll want to make sure, because one of the positions in this advisory board, there are two positions for two towers to be on that, and that's where the process of new laws and rules and regulations are going to be made. This is one of those advisory boards. There's no remuneration for you and get paid because you go there. Some of them have a little stipend they do. This one uh, happens not to. But I put the, all the information in there that you can read through if you're involved in towing or uh, want to know more about that advisory board. So I'm not going to go through all those pages uh, to uh, cover all the uh, issues with the towing. Any questions? Over on page 17. Uh, this is fourth substitute, Senate Bill 50. Substitute bills mean they're making a substitute change and the bill gets changed as a process and every time they make a change, then sometimes a new substitute bill has to be um, done. This one had four substitutes to it. This is automobile, automobile insurance registry. This deals with the security interest. In other words, your insurance verification that the person driving the car has insurance. There's two parts to this that it talks about. In paragraph two, about a third of the way down, it says, uh, subject to the restrictions of the section, the division of any peace officer without a warrant, and this is where words are important, the word shall and may. In uh, paragraph uh, little i, it says, shall seize and take possession of any vehicle that is being operated on a highway without owner operator, operator's security in effect, and the vehicle was involved in an accident. So they can impound it, if the vehicle, and it says they shall impound it if the vehicle was involved in an accident. There's no option for an officer unless he just decides to ignore the shall. So it still becomes a little dis discretion to the officer whether he will, but the law says they shall impound it if the guy doesn't have owner operator's insurance on it. The may part comes in the next section, uh, two little i, it says may seize and take possession of any vehicle that is being operated on a highway without the owner operator security in effect as required under the section. In other words, if you don't have it, you're not involved in an accident, they may still impound it, but they don't have to. Okay? Then it talks about further in the last three paragraphs there about what is considered um, proof. And that can be in a written statement by a producer or an insurance company, or if somebody purchases a new vehicle, if there's a statement that says, hey, I used to drive a, a, a 2006 Camry, and now I'm going to drive a 2008 Camry because I just, my insurance is transferring, those sorts of documentations count in that process. Okay. Uh, let's see. That's page 18. Um, Effective date of this, and by the way, there you'll see a lot of the effective dates are May 9th. That's because 60 days after the session. If a bill doesn't have a specific implementation date, it's always 60 days after. And so that's why May 9th is important. On the evening of May 8th, you'll hear on the news that 200 and some odd new laws went into effect. That's why. This one has to do with insurance service contracts. There are some insurance, or excuse me, some service contracts out there that are for scheduled maintenance only. In other words, this service contract says, I'll change your oil four times a year or six times a year, and it covers this and this. Uh, because there were questions with the insurance commissioner and others, this clarifies that if you have a service contract that is just for maintenance, it's not really considered a service contract. Okay, it's not considered a service contract. Um, uh, halfway down the page, Senate Bill 16, sales and use tax exemptions. This has to do with car washes. It says that sales of cleaner washing of a vehicle are taxed, are not taxed, but if you involve the interior or cleaning or washing of the interior of the vehicle, it is. So for me, the difference is if you're de detailing the car in and out, it's taxable. If you're running it through a car wash or you're just washing a car, it's not taxable. Make sense? Because there, has, there hasn't been really clarification. People are always wondering when I do bills. So if I, if I hire somebody in to just come and wash my cars twice a week on my, you know, you see the power sprayer guys doing all that, that's just washing the exterior of the car, not subject to sales tax. If you do the outside and the inside and make it more like a detail where you go in and out, then it's going to be subject to tax. And this will clarify what that process is for all those entities that come out and do service work on cleaning cars. Okay? That bill, by the way, doesn't start till January 1st of 18 as well, just for your note. There's a couple of power sport uh, pieces that I wanted to cover as well. Uh, this has to do with um, 
safety courses. This codifies in state language that allows a third party entity to teach education classes on ridership. This would be for like ATV safety courses and that sort of thing. Um, there was a question in the law before that whether that could actually be done, whether the state parks and recreation could have other people do that. Somebody's been doing that, and there's a couple other people uh, who are out there teaching safety courses, but any safety course has to be approved by uh, the Department of Natural Resources, in this case, probably State Parks Division. Um, and so this is very similar to what we do with dealer education, but this has to do with rider safety and rider privileges and things they do as riding off highway vehicles. Street legal ATVs, we talked about this a couple years ago on the next page, on page 20. On street legal ATVs, uh, this has to do with where you ride your vehicle at. Uh, a couple years ago, a law was passed that said uh, that you could ride a street legal, not an off-highway, but a vehicle that's licensed for street legal, which means it has a license plate and headlights and taillights and, you know, all the things that qualify for being legal to be operated on the street. Those could be used in any city in the whole state of Utah, except the state, except the city of Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City had an exemption because they were, if you look about halfway down, it talks about in one of the, in the section A there, the highway is a, in a county of the first class. Salt Lake County is a highway, or a highway, is a county of the first class. The county of first class is based on population, and Salt Lake County said, we don't want people in razors driving down our streets. You, had, you go to Utah County, you could, you could go to Tooele, you could go to Summit, and you could use those on the streets in those counties, but not in Salt Lake County. The argument was, the people who are getting street legal ATVs in Salt Lake, they're paying all the same taxes and all the fees and everything else that everybody else does. Why can't they use it? The legislature passed this bill, so now all 29 counties you can ride a street legal ATV in the county unless it meets other certain criteria. About uh, three-fourths of the way down, it lists those uh, the highway of a county of a first class. That's not in place anymore, but the grade separated portion of a highway. So in other words, if there's a highway and you know how you can ride on some of the sides, if, this, if this, the county decides that's not a safe place to be, they can exempt those out. The other portion is on uh, they have to give appropriate signage that says this street may not be used by an ATV. And then there's also a restriction that's always been in place for a, vehicle, or for a um, uh, road. You can't use it on a road that's posted on 50 miles an hour or greater. Okay. So if you wanted to go down 7th East, 40, 45 miles an hour in a razor side by side, you could do that legally again. Uh, and that will be effective in May, that bill passed. So now it should be the same throughout the state. Page 21 deals with helmets. Um, this is a simple bill that just changed uh, one actually number. In this case, it said that it increases the age of those who are required to wear helmets from 18 to 21. So if you have 16 to 21 year old that are riding in your ATVs or, or off highway, that sort of thing, if you're doing street legal, obviously you're gonna to need to have a helmet on those uh, people as part of that process, okay? Boat registration, you so may... Does that, does that motorcycle? Yes, mm -hmm. yep, changes the motorcycle, motor whatever you're riding on ATVs, so that means motorcycle, ATVs, side-by-sides, any of those, all require a helmet from every, anyone from 21 years on down, because children obviously have to do that already. On the bottom of page 21 is the boat registration amendments. You may remember a few years ago that they took the mailing address off of the registration for passenger cars because people were breaking in while you're in the theater and they get in your glove box and find out your address and call their buddy and they go to your house while you're at the theater and steal your stuff. Those doggone thieves, huh? So they took the address off of that, but now they've added a couple things back on. One of them, if you look at the very bottom, where it section says 41A301 is for, for a vehicle, that's only for trucks and commercial vehicles. And the section 731817 is for a vessel. So if you own a boat, they're gonna start putting the address back on boat registrations for the owner and the address that are on there. So those would be two new exceptions. because somebody had a wild idea that they thought this was a good idea. I, I never question about why people do those kinds of things because most time they don't make sense. Page 22 is uh, HB 95. This is where the um, Bureau of Land Management is now going to work with uh, the uh, state parks and Little Sahara will become a state park. It's under, been under the jurisdiction of the um, BLM 
for up, up till uh, May 9th. After that, it will become a state park, so the state will have control of that rather than BLM. <clears throat> And then I put also this uh, concurrent resolution to secure. I love the title, it's so long. Uh, this is a uh, concurrent resolution. It's a resolution, it's a message bill to certain people. This one is titled, uh, Resolution to Secure the Perpetual Health and Vitality of Utah's Premier Public Lands. And this is a statement, if you go through it, I'm not gonna go through all these, but all the whereas's talk about why we're such a great state. If you get down to the bottom of page 23, it talks about the whereas of to re, in retaining public lands in public ownership and improving the way the public lands are managed. So it goes to a land management issue. And then also further on, on, on page 24, it talks about all the notifications for this resolution should go out to all the cities and county commissioners, uh, should go to the attorney general, to the pre, even clerk to the president of the United States. And a lot of this was to have to do with who's gonna have control over the 67% of our state that's controlled by the federal government. So one of those message bills. A lot of the power sport dealers were very interested in that, so we included that in our, in our class. On page 25, there is a grant program uh, uh, for substitute Senate Bill 264 is a grant program uh, that allows for the transient room tax, some of that to be used for outdoor recreation and somebody can apply to, for a grant to, um, to improve the infrastructure uh, for the uh, off-highway vehicles. That's a pretty big um, uh, fund, and the transient room tax produces a lot of money in the state of Utah. I think for every dollar uh, that we spend in advertising for tourism in our state, there's an $18 return. So that's kind of like, if you give me a dollar, well, I'll give you 18 back. Now, who's not going to sign up for that? So that's part of this program, and that money comes in. Uh, through the transient room tax now going to be used for off-highway issues, okay? Uh, other bills I thought you'd be interested in is the uh, DUI bill. You probably heard about that where they're changing the uh, blood alcohol level to 0 0.05 from 0 0.08. Uh, we were the first ones to go from 10 to, to 8. Now we're the first one to go from 8 to 5. Uh, virtually all over Europe, that 0 0.05 is the standard in Europe, interestingly enough. And uh, so this allows the law enforcement agencies to also receive training on that and uh, making sure that they're applying the law correctly. Uh, page 28 is uh, the introduction of Photocop. I'm sure many of you remember a number of years ago, they tried to put Photocop out there so they'd have a camera at each of the intersections. And if you ran the red light, you, you would get a ticket based on the, you know, they take a picture of you in the front of your plate. They do this a lot in Europe already, uh, but this is kind of a photocop bill where they've had so many problems with uh, school buses. Uh, they, they've had a lot of people blown through school buses. In fact, they showed some video of some kids standing back on the curb and the bus was about a car width out from the curb. And the kids were just stepping off just like that and a car came shooting through there like 30 miles an hour between the kids and the school bus getting on the bus with all the signs and stuff going out. <clears throat> Pretty scary stuff. So. Um, they decided that they would fund uh, these photocop, if you will, these cameras to catch violators doing that. And then they're cited for that. There's pretty hefty fine for that. That money would go into a fund to uh, put more uh, cameras out there and to go to uh, safety with buses and children, that sort of thing. I'm sorry again. Only applies to buses. The only discussion we had about it is, you know, there's this camel theory that we always talk about. It's like they used to talk about over in, in Arabia. You know, it's like these guys used to go out in the desert and the camel would want to stick his nose in the tent. And if the guy let him stick, if the, if the guy, if the Arab went and let him stick the nose of the camel in, for sure the rest of it's going to follow in. This is what I call one of the camel bills because as soon as the nose comes, what else is coming? That's what we really have to watch for. It's kind of like as soon as, you know, you get one foot in the door, the rest is sure to follow, so, so we'll follow that. Um, uh, page 28 was kind of a uh, fix-it bill for the tax commission. The tax commission is required to have open meetings, which it states in here that they have to, but if they hold a meeting to instruct their employees on policy, that those aren't open meetings. There was discussion on that, because some people, I guess, were coming into the meetings of instructions for employees on how to apply the law and that sort of thing, and they felt that uh, they wanted to come to that. Tax Commission felt that it shouldn't be that we ought to be able to talk with our employees about how we're going to implement this. And so now those employees' meetings are closed meetings, but 
those meetings have to be recorded and uh, has to, and, the, and reports have to be given to the tax and revenue um, interim committee, which is a committee of legislators. So they're not just able to go in there in their back room, dark room, and do what they want. Uh, it's still reportable. Uh, there was a change to the DUI impound fee uh, refund process. If a person who was arrested for DUI, the driver's license division determines that they are not guilty of that and were charged, charged the DUI impound fee and they actually paid it, the person could apply for that refund back. But they, <clears throat> excuse me, they had to do that within a 30 day time period. Many times the process took much longer than 30 days. So what they did is increase that time period from 30 days to 180 days. So the person has actually six months to apply for the refund and get that back. And that was also for a stolen vehicle as well uh, for fees related to that. Any questions? Great, we're moving along good pace. Um, page 30. Special group license plates. We always have, every year we have new ones, right? This year we're actually getting rid of one. Um, there was a lot of uh, jokes made about this bill, but it has to do with prostate cancer and prostate screenings and all those things that go with that. But this basically, there was a prostate cancer plate that you could pay your $25 into. That money would go into a prostate cancer fund. They now shut that down and moved over into the cancer research fund. If any, there, the prostate cancer plate will no longer be issued after um, after September, so you have to get it. If you want one of those, your customer's gonna to have to do that before October 1st, after that, no more new ones, okay? But that money will go into this can cancer research restricted account. Uh, motor vehicle franchise amendments, this bill, this actually had to do with the franchise law, the same one that's being heard uh, by our Utah State Supreme Court. This had to do with um, safety recalls, which we've talked about every year for the last several years, and gosh, it doesn't seem like there's a week or a couple of weeks that go by we don't hear about recalls, right? And so this comes back to some liability. Now from the manufacturer's side, if I'm selling, for example, a Chevy, and Chevy comes back and says that uh, you, this is, uh, you have to stop selling or you can't drive these vehicles because of a safety violation, there had to be remuneration from the manufacturer back to the dealer because now they're pulling all that inventory and whatever that's being stopped from being sold. Uh, they, the dealer doesn't want to have to keep paying for all that. They want to turn it back to the manufacturer so they don't have flooring and other costs that uh, have to be done. That bill did not pass, but that's going to be heard in interim study. And I'm sure other discussions concerning uh, the franchise law and how that's going to come together uh, will take place at the same time. In a second, I'll talk about the buyback provision in just a second. Let me just cover this new plate that we have. You know, there's always one year, we always have one new plate, right? So page 31 is the uh, SB 245. It's the second amendment special plate. I figured it would be coming sooner or later, here it is. So this has to do with the second amendment plate. It's a new plate. Uh, you have to put in $25 into the fund. It's put into the... Um, uh, the money is put in to support the Second Amendment and state-owned shooting ranges, or, uh, or excuse me, and state-owned shooting ranges. So this $25 donation goes to support these ranges that are out there. Um, don't know what they're going to look like yet or if they're going to have enough to sell. We have a lot of these specialty plates that people could buy into, but there has to be a minimum number of amount of those sold before they'll actually manufacture the decal on the plate for that. Okay. So it'll be interesting to see if this one, this one does not go into effect. This one has a little different implementation date. It's October 1st, okay? So that will be coming. Let me tell you about on page 33, um, a bill that we killed. Uh, this came out of a representative out of Utah County. If you remember when you register a vehicle, every time the vehicle is registered, you have to pay the age-based fee for that. Legislator thought that that was he felt like double taxation, even though it's a fee, it's not a tax. He felt like it was double taxation. And if somebody paid it in March and the vehicle is resold in, in September, that that person in September shouldn't have to pay that. Well, you as dealers, and we don't have the ability to really look up to see what's been paid and what hasn't, created a lot of administrative problems for us. Um, not only that, but he's talking about giving a refund to a fee 
as opposed to a tax, which created a lot of problems. And the third part is I don't know how in the world he would overcome the fiscal note that went, would go with this because there are a number of vehicles that are sold during the course of the year that's going to pay that age base fee multiple times during the year. That's got to impact the budget and where that money goes to. School districts were not happy with it and there was because they get part of the money that goes into the general fund and so on and so forth. Uh, so that bill did not pass, but I will not be surprised uh, that that comes back. The other part that's not on there is he also talked about including a section uh, to also transfer. Why, why do I have to buy new plates when I buy a new car? Or train, change car, not a new car, but you know, a new car to me. And I said, well, you can take your plate with you. All you have to do is, you know, you don't have to buy a plate. You can move your plate with you just like you would a specialty plate or anything else. You just pay, what is it, a dollar or whatever it is, and you can transfer it instead of buying $6 for a new plate every time. But he still wanted to put that in there and say, hey, why well, don't we just keep the plates with the cars? So that bill did not pass. Um, everybody in the world was against that. The tax commission, the county assessors, the dealers associations, and everybody involved in that was pretty much against that, so it did not go anywhere. Okay? Let's talk about Canadian vehicles for a minute. That seems to be something that is very prevalent in our uh, community. Uh, if you remember, even last year, we talked about Canadian vehicles. Um, do I have to disclose that it's a Canadian vehicle to every purchaser, or do I just do it the first time? The answer is every time, okay? You're probably all familiar with, this is a tax commission form, 353. A lot of you use this, particularly those of you who are selling trucks, right? because there's a lot of Canadian vehicles out there in trucks. Last year, the question came up on this form. It says, this form must be accompanied by a completed TC-706 statement of compliance. The 706 statement of compliance, so in other words, if you're selling a Canadian vehicle, this said you had to have both. Well, the form 706 was for the person who was importing the vehicle in to the country to make sure it met the requirements, you know, changing the odometer, meet safety standards, and that it may or may not have warranty. So they're, they're, they're bringing those vehicles in to make sure they comply with U.S. law. And if you do that, then you need the 706. But once that happens, you don't need the 706. So if you're importing vehicles, changing them all out, and then selling to your customer, then you're going to need both forms. But what about those of you who just go to the auction, buy one that's Canadian or whatever, what's your disclosure? This form is being changed, okay? They're taking off the statement that this form has to be accompanied by the 706. So you can still use this form, even though it's going to change and says that this uh, should be done. You need to make sure that you uh, disclose this to your customer. That's why this is one of the tax commission forms we do in multiple parts, because a copy of this has to go to your customer and a copy stays in your deal jacket, okay? because you're disclosing that this vehicle is a Canadian vehicle, and that's every time the vehicle is sold, wholesale accepted. Okay, so if you're doing it at the auction, they're already declaring them at the auctions and doing that disclosure there. Okay, so this will change, that sentence will come off, but make sure you're doing, I talk to a lot of dealers and they're saying, oh, that only has to be done when the first time it comes in and is registered. No, that's not the case. You have to do it every time you sell a Canadian or a vehicle that was manufactured. We always focus on Canadian. There's some that have been manufactured in Mex Mexico or over in Europe. Those also apply under here. It's not just Canadian, even though we fondly call this the Canadian disclosure because that's pretty much what we see. Okay, any questions about that? <clears throat> so what about wholesale? Wholesale, you just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, so yep. Um, I think I would know. I would think you would, yes. That you should be disclosing that. If you have a Canadian vehicle, I know the auctions do that, right? Well, I know the auctions do, yeah. but we've bought a couple that they didn't tell us. Right. They, they, should, they should be disclosing because it says a person who sells the vehicle, and it doesn't say wholesale or retail. Okay. okay. Yep. FTC Buyer's Guide. You're all real familiar with this? It may look a little bit different. This is actually a draft. It's not quite the size. But there's a new buyer's guide that went into effect January 1. Okay? Uh, we will have these in our office soon. The old ones are all still good until January of 2018. So you can use up all your old ones. The new ones will start coming, and there's some changes you will see on there, and it's outlined in your book. But basically, you'll see there's check boxes for as is and dealer warranty. But then they're asked if it's a full warranty or a limited warranty. Again, you know you never put full warranty, correct? Even the manufacturer doesn't offer a full warranty. It's always a limited warranty, okay? And then you do the same thing you've always been doing on the, on the uh, systems covered and the duration. You're always going dis to disclose those if there's a warranty on that. 
But now there's a series of check boxes. The check boxes say uh, manufacturer warranty still applies. So if you have a vehicle that's transferable that the warranty applies, you're going to check that. Manufacturers used vehicle warranty applies, uh, and then other used vehicle warranty applies. So depending on where that situation, what kind of warranty is going to be transferred over, depends on which box you're going to do. The other box is still on there. It says a service contract can be sold with this. So it's start the vehicle still sold as is. But the service contract, there's a service contract available for you to purchase like a 12 month, 12,000 mile service contract, okay? The other thing that's added to this is um, ask the dealer if your mechanic can inspect the vehicle on or off the lot. Under the old law, it always said that you had the right to have a mechanic, but now you should ask if it can be done on or off the lot. Apparently there's been a problem with people taking cars to their mechanics and the mechanics mouse with them and mess them up and some dealers don't want those cars to be only to be looked at by the qualified people. Uh, the other thing that it talks about here, and this uh, talks about open safety recalls now. We knew some things were coming on this, but from the safety recall information, it says that the customer has a right to a open safety recall. And I'll give you some information on that in a minute. Um, and it gives the addresses for that. And then there's also a piece on here that says that if this is done in Spanish, there's a Spanish version of this available. And if you do any part of the sale in Spanish, you have to do a Spanish buyer's guide, which we also have in stock. On the back side, this was the known possible defects for a car. There are a couple things that have been uh, added to this, such as airbags and uh, exhaust system and a couple other things on here. These are the typical things. These were the things that when this first came about in 1980, gosh, it was 82 or 3. I was still around then, if you believe that long ago. It's like ancient history, okay? If you look at these things, all of these things were on the front of this, and you had to check a little box that said OK or not OK on every one of those items. And if you checked OK, that means you were implying a warranty on that. That's how bad that was when it first started. We were able to revert that to the back of that. Mr. Customer, here's the things that can typically go wrong. Here's the things you may want to check out to make sure you're buying a good product. Okay. Still, this information on the bottom is required for name, address, and phone number if a person has a complaint. That can be the manager, it can be the salesman, it can be whoever you want, but you have to disclose that. The signature line is optional. We put the signature line on because history in Utah, said, the judge always says, Mr. Mr. Customer, did you sign this form or did the dealer explain it to you? Well, he never explained it to me. The dealer says, yes, I explained it. And not only that, he signed it on the bottom here that I explained it to him as a separate form. So we always err on the side that, yes, Mr. Customer, you read and signed the form that you're agreeing to get a copy and understand it. OK? And Perfect. When, did, when does this take effect? This took effect January 1 of this year. It's already in effect. But they are allowing a whole year time span annually from when it went into effect till so the end of this year, you can use up all your old ones. When you're ready to change over to the new ones, you just make your transition. We'll have some old ones, but we'll be transitioning out, I'll bet, by midsummer out of the old ones into the new ones. So the sooner you can make that transition, obviously, the better for you it's going to be because it is the law currently. Okay? The, um, so there's the information on the buyer's guide. Um, the uh, dealer... Um, Registration form. You knew there was changes last year. There are now three default plates. So right here, there's going to be a little bit of change, and hopefully they didn't change it too much that you have to redo your form. But more than likely, they did. They're never good about that. But on here, the default plates are in God We Trust, Life Elevated, uh, and Life Elevated Skier. So the arches and the skier and the, and the In God We Trust are now the three plates that you can get without an additional amount of money. And that's now been changed on there. Now, Tax Commission also put in their bulletin that if you don't declare, in the, in the old days, if you didn't pick one or the other one, it was the skier, the arches plate, they would, they would default to one of those. I can't remember what it was, arches, I think. I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. Because now if you don't put it in there, they're going to reject your paperwork. Now, if you just come here, there's not a problem. Okay, because typically we know what you want, or we'll call you and say, hey, you forgot to check, which one do you want? Another good reason to use us, right? Okay. So that is uh, new coming out, and we have the new um, registration forms available right now to do that. Now, can you use the old ones? You can use the old ones, but you need to get rid of those as quickly as you can. Okay. There's been some questions that come into our office concerning front license plate. Do you have to have a front license plate on your car? Everybody go, yes, because the law says you have to. 
The difference is, is that if you don't have one, it's not a primary offense, so a police officer can't pull you over for not having a print plate. If he pulls you over for like speeding or a stop sign or some, or some other reason, then he can cite you for not having a front plate. He estimates by, I can't remember who I heard it from, tax commissioners, public safety, or somebody at the Capitol was about a little more than 20% of the cars in Utah don't have front plates, okay? So that's, uh, and law enforcement likes front plates because then they can see what's going on and, and uh, if they have amber alerts and those sorts of things, it really helps them with that. Uh, again, it's, it goes through the process of license plates, and this applies to you, especially your dealer plates, okay? So in paragraph number three, about a third of the way down, a license plate shall at all times be A, securely fastened, uh, two, in a horizontal position, height not less than 12 inches from the ground, and that's not in the dealer side, this is for consumers. So yours can be, as long as you meet that criteria in your back window, as long as you meet all the criteria, you would probably be okay. Free from foreign materials, that's where people put covers over the front of them and they yellow up and they can't be read. Uh, and clearly legible. And it would only be a secondary fence. And, uh, and so there's, uh, the only exception to that is the clearly visible part if you look at the very bottom. Uh, about three years ago with the law was passed where if you have a trailer hitch or a wheelchair lift or top of page 39, a trailer being towed, bike rack, a cargo device, those are, um, those are things that are exempt for being clearly visible, okay? So as long as the officer's being able to walk up to your car and see the plate, if he's sitting in his patrol car and looking at your car and can't see it, it's not a violation because you have a trailer on or a luggage rack or something like that, okay? Sales tax rate, we put down the website because there's always changes to sales tax that can change on the local or city or county or state level. We suggest at least once a quarter you check your sales tax rate to make sure it's correct. If you go to that tax.utah.gov sales rates, if you check that periodically, you can verify in your specific location what your tax rate should be. I highly suggest you do that regularly. Uh, we will try and remind you of those as they change, uh, as we see sales tax changes be made. Uh, vehicle recalls, uh, that's always been an issue. We've been talking about that for the last several years. Um, cars that have open recalls, can you sell them? The answer is yes, okay. Um, there is an interesting case I put in here about the New York Attorney General's office. It's in the second paragraph that says, the New York Attorney General recently subpoenaed records from every dealer in the state of New York to verify that they were disclosing open recalls to their customers. Dealers were told they could pay a $1,000 fine and not worry about submitting their documents to the AG. Most dealers did just that, generating thousands of dollars for the New York State, state of New York, okay? That's what's kind of going on in some of the other states. What should we be doing at this point? The recommendation we have heard from multiple sources, including our legal counsel at NIADA was, you probably should be uh, letting your customer know that there's an open recall on a vehicle. How do you do that? If you go to that, uh, uh, on the bottom of page 39, it talks about recalls. If you go to that bottom there, there's the nitsa.gov forward slash recalls. You can put in the VIN number of that vehicle and see if there's a recall. There's also the uh, safercar.gov website, and that's actually shown on the page before where it talks about the buyer's guide. So safercar.gov, top of page 37 is the address for that. But safercar.gov, whichever one you use, it doesn't matter. Our suggestion is that when you pull that up for every vehicle sale that you just print out a copy, give a copy to the customer, you keep a copy, have them just sign it on the bottom of the form, because it's just a printout based on the VIN number for their car and shows the recalls and then keep that in your deal jack to show you complied with it. Make sense? Questions, concerns, have you run across anything? Gosh, we did good, we're just about an hour. Did we do good? Heck yeah. Okay, so who has questions for me? Anybody have questions? Okay. If there's anything um, else that you need to go, I would hope that w two things. One, those of you who aren't members of the association, these are all the reasons why we're here. This is why you need to be a member. It's $325 a year. That's less than a dollar a day to have a representative on Capitol Hill for you, okay? And to meet with all the other government agencies, the tax commission, the public safety, the county assessors, the treasurers, the you name it, we work with those people. 
that's got to be worth $325, and that waives the $50 sign-up fee if you sign up within um, a week of your education class. And we would like to have every dealer be a member of the association. Okay, and then the uh, last thing is, is we, once you take the class, we will have that on the system for the uh, tax commission to show that you took your three-hour education class. And, and when you get your renewal, do the normal process. I'm hearing it's supposed to be exactly the same as it's been in years past. Do it all electronically. Your education portion will already be on the system. If there's nothing else, thank you very much. And uh, again, we hope that you'll get back to us with any question you have. We want to be your resource for any information that you need. And thanks for being here.